This is a production of Cornell University. Okay, good morning. I thought I'd put my acknowledgement slide first since <laughs> the end is always hard to get to. So the numerous people that were possible, that made the research possible that I'll talk about in a bit, um, as well as many funding sources that made this possible. And I've, there's probably oversights, but this is a decent stab at um, the people that have contributed. What I wanted to do was first kind of put things into perspective and talk a little bit about the floriculture and horticulture uh, and the importance that they are in the US and the New York economy. Um, and then talk a bit more about abiotic stress tolerance and then kind of, okay, look at case studies in abiotic stress tolerance in floriculture crops, which would be a, a primary focus of my uh, research program. So if you look at uh, the horticulture industry in the US, you can broadly divide it into three groups, uh, fruits, nuts, and berries, which in 2007 were worth $18.6 billion wholesale farm gate value. Second would be nursery, greenhouse, and sod. So floriculture would very much fit into this category. So these would be the crops that you can't eat, but you can still enjoy them. Um, and then vegetables for 14.7 billion. So collectively about $50 billion worth of, uh, of horticultural crops. If you compare that to the, the hundreds of millions of acres of corn and soybeans and wheat that are grown, they're valued at $77.2 billion. So this would be a much more intensive type of agriculture production. The floriculture industry, specifically in the US, which would be comprised primarily of cut flowers, potted plants, bedding plants, um, and propagative materials, cuttings and seeds and bulbs and things like that that go into the above crops. It's about a $4 billion industry a year. It has declined a little bit since the recession in 2008. So it was uh, higher uh, back in 2007. Uh, and uh, among the, the various types of crops that we grow, bedding plants, which would be annuals and perennials that are grown uh, primarily in the spring and sold in the spring and then are supposed to be transplanted into your landscape or transplanted into, um, into hanging uh, baskets and containers and things like that, they make up about $2 billion or about half of the U.S. floriculture industry. And those will be the crops that are going to primarily focus on a little bit with potted plants as well, which would be things like poinsettias and orchids that we're more enjoying inside our house um, and then throwing away once they look ugly, if you're like me. So New York State's floriculture industry has about uh, 600 production operations with a wholesale value uh, approaching $200 million. Uh, we have 568 acres of greenhouses and our national ranking has varied from about fifth to eighth since I've been in New York, and it sort of just depends on the year and how well uh, New York growers did and as that compares to the rest of the country. So if we have six good weekends of sales in April and May and early June, that can, that can uh, really improve the economic value, even the wholesale value of our industry. Uh, and to put it into context, if you look at the uh, other agriculture commodities in New York State, um, the top four or so are all related to the dairy industry pretty much, so either milk or uh, our feedstocks to support the milk production. Um, and then apples would be number five and floriculture would be uh, number six. So the question is why study abiotic stress tolerance? And we'll back up and take kind of this holistic worldwide perspective. And if you think about the increasing worldwide scarcity of resources, such as water, uh, arable land, and then fossil fuels, uh, which we need to either heat greenhouses or run farm equipment or bring things to market. Uh, fossil fuels are also the inputs for uh, petrochemicals, which are used heavily in agriculture and horticulture as well. Uh, so in addition, global climate change means that we're having these more erratic temperatures and more erratic water availability. And in general, if we have plants that are more resistant to any of these stresses, whether they be drought or heat, uh, maybe cold stress, if we could grow a plant in a greenhouse with, with less heat and allow it to be colder, um, this would improve our situation in terms of producing more crops, using resources uh, uh, more efficiently. And I thought this was interesting. This was from uh, the UN, the, project, the projected world population. We're currently at uh, 
seven billion. Um, and this could go probably following the, the kind of medium thought by the UN is that this would go up to um, nine billion in fairly short order and peaking out at about uh, 10 billion or so. However, if you look at kind of a worst case scenario for world population, it would be increasing just as fast over the next 100 years as it has for the past 100 years. Uh, and so um, besides the population growing to 9 billion by 2040, the UN tells us that by 2030, um, beyond population growth, we're going to have 3 billion more middle class consumers, which mean people that can afford to eat either more calories or more calories as meat or uh, other, other uh, high quality food stuff. So we're going to need to be able to produce 50% more food. Um, and yet, uh, with this, we're going to need 45% more energy to do that and 30% more water to do that. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about abiotic stress. And the reason I'm going to do that is I'm not an entomologist or a pathologist, so I don't work with insect stresses or virus stresses or disease stresses. But essentially, things like salinity, drought, heat, chilling, freezing, flooding, um, nutrients, whether they're inadequate or they're, they're excessive. Um, I thought this was funny. This was someone's hanging basket that they killed because of drought stress. And so they put a couple of skulls on it to decorate it for Halloween. <laughs> Um, and so you might ask, when do floriculture crops exhibit abiotic stress if we're growing them in these nice, perfect greenhouse environments? Um, and I would argue that the plants are potentially experiencing stress at many different stages throughout their life. It could be, yes, in the production stage in the greenhouse, whether the grower forgets to irrigate them or doesn't want to irrigate them as much as they like, whether the, gro whether the greenhouse gets excessively hot and in the summertime when the sun does come out, um, greenhouses heat up very quickly. That's called the greenhouse effect. They trap in heat. Um, and also, there's, there's been look uh, by farmers trying to use minimally heated or unheated greenhouses, simple structures such as high tunnels for growing greenhouse crops. And that's been in, I've done some research in that area as well. And so if you have plants that can handle you know, chilling stresses or freezing stresses during production, that would be helpful for them as well. So besides just the greenhouse production stage, then you can look at the retail stage of the crop. Uh, so my daughter and I walked into Walmart last spring and we saw these nice impatience hanging baskets here. And I asked my four-year-old daughter, okay, what's, what's wrong with the plant on the right? And she said, Daddy, does it need more water? And I said, yes, you got it. <laughs> but the, the truth is um, about half of the floriculture products that we sell are marketed through these big box stores. And when they get there, very little attention is paid to caring for them. So a large grower that I spoke to in Michigan said that if uh, he, uh, he sells his plants in two large supermarkets, um, he says if they don't sell them within three days at the supermarket, they pretty much go into the dumpster. And so despite the fact that you could theoretically continue to water this plant, to fertilize this plant, and care for it before it gets purchased by a consumer and brought to their house, <laughs> it just isn't happening. And so if we could add you know, some days on to the shelf life of that plant, that would be beneficial. Um, OK, and then of course, in the landscape, or like in this hanging basket, essentially once the product gets to the consumer, if we can make it last longer and make it more enjoyable for them, uh, we're more likely to engage the, the public in buying floriculture products. So if we look at why it's important to improve the abiotic stress tolerance in floriculture crops, you could think of kind of the, the short term, maybe current um, grower mentality, and that would be to improve profitability. So if you have plants more resistant to, to stress or these problems, you're going to reduce crop losses or get away with a higher quality crop, even though uh, maybe uh, uh, old fashioned petunia variety that from 20 years ago may not have put up with that kind of stress and may have died uh, quickly. Uh, it can allow us to reduce inputs such as water, uh, fertilizer, and energy, um, and improve consumer success with their products. Um, ultimately, I kind of look at it more as the long-term survival of the industry. And so in light of all of these declining resources worldwide, floriculture is going to need to compete against agriculture. And if our society looks at, OK, uh, we need fruit and vegetables and grain crops because we eat them. We may not need um, flowers. So there may be this perception as flowers as a luxury item. And so if there's competing resources, a luxury item is going to eventually lose out. So what are your thoughts in the 
the audience here today. Are flowers a luxury item? There's no right answer. <laughs> yes or no? <laughs> Yeah. Okay. If if all right, depends where they are. If they're in your house or in your garden. Others. Maybe it depends if you're well fed every day. Then they're no. Then um. Then you're not thinking so much about your caloric intake, and then um, then they're not so much a luxury item. So I would I would counter some of the arguments with okay. So if flowers are a luxury item, how about fresh tomatoes in New York in January? Which, you know, there could be several months of the year where our ancestors lived on root vegetables for, uh, you know, for years and years and years. And so uh, growing these crops somewhere else or in a heated greenhouse uh, could be a luxury item. And bananas year round in the US, grain fed meat. Um, and then you could go even farther and think about, you know, what are all of the ways that we spend our carbon footprint, like driving a car to work every day, um, taking a plane to go to our annual conferences and things like that. So in the end, I think there's not this black and white area where flour should be labeled a luxury item, but it's more of this gray scale of how does our, si how, how does our society prioritize how we, you know, allocate the resources that we have. Um, and I would argue that, you know, we all know that flowers beautify our surroundings, like Alex mentioned, you know, if they're outdoors, um, there's, there's research that shows that if you landscape a house properly, it can increase the real sale value by as much as 14%. Um, and you know that we've had houses sitting on the market for a long time, a well-landscaped house apparently sells uh, six weeks sooner. So there's a real, uh, uh, a real economic value associated with them there. If you look at plants in an indoor environment, you know that you can look at dozens of papers that find specific benefits, such as they reduce the carbon dioxide in an indoor environment. They reduce the volatile organic uh, compounds. Uh, one study found worker productivity was increased 12% if there were X number of house plants per um, square feet of office space, and likewise reduced employee sick days. Um, work with hospitals finds decreased length of hospital stays. So those are all very real. Um, economic values as well. Uh, and so if I were to summarize my research program over the past five years, the central theme could be abiotic stress tolerance, and then there would be different aspects of it that I've looked at. Um, and a couple I'm not really going to focus on today. So um, fertilizers and fertilizer use efficiency with either um, uh, conventional fertilizers or organic fertilizers has been a large part of my research program, but we'll save that for a different discussion. Um, as well, I've, I've collaborated with Chris Ween to look at um, growing bedding plants in unheated high tunnels and you know, sort of sorting out which uh, species and cultivars are more successful under those conditions and which ones are not, and what are you know, the, the, length, uh, the lengthening of the crop production time that it might take, and what are the effects on plant quality. But instead, we're going to focus just on uh, these three primary topics. Um, and so we'll start by looking at screening for salt tolerance, and then we'll move on to look at um, exogenous compounds to improve tolerance, and then finally some molecular techniques. So first, screening for salt and drought tolerance, and why the focus on um, drought and salt stress. So a lot of the abiotic stress tolerance I talk about will be drought and salt stress, but not all of it. You'll see some different stresses. Um, so agriculture accounts for 70% of global water use, and irrigated land is quite important. Um, it represents only about 20% of farmland, but um, it supplies 42% of the world's food. So it's you know, very efficient land um, in terms of production um, yields. Um, saline soils also represent 7% of the world land area. And so if we're looking at needing this increasing amount of arable land or land that we can access to increase our food supply by 50%, we're going to have to be better at growing crops either on saline soils uh, or using saline irrigation water. Um, and in some cases, drought and salt stress might be thought of as having similar effects on the plant. Some of the effects uh, would be osmotic effects or you know, <coughs> high salt concentration in the, in the soil makes it difficult for roots to extract enough water uh, to meet the needs of the top part of the plant. And so that can be thought of as a physiological drought, so wilting shorter plants, reduced leaf surface area, and then the responses of the plant, such as stomatal closure or an increase in reactive oxygen species 
Um, and then depending on the type of salt that you're looking at, certainly there can be more salt specific effects. So that could be <coughs> seen, you know, like the cell damage here, which could be due to excess accumulation of sodium and chloride leading to cell wall disruption and uh, previous to that enzyme disruption and so on. Um, so the first person in my lab was um, Gonzalo Villarino. And he started as a master's student, and now he's a PhD student. Um, his first project with me was to screen 14 of the most popular bedding plants for salt tolerance. So I wanted to see, okay, of the, of the plants that were, that were growing, uh, how problematic is it? And then using this, develop some practical guidelines for greenhouse growers. So in the end, Gonzalo selected 14 species the ones highlighted in red could be thought of as, as among the kind of top 10 um, floriculture crops. And there's a, a couple that aren't in the top 10 that we didn't have. Um, and essentially uh, had seedlings uh, that we started. We transplanted them and grew them on for five weeks, exposing them uh, to sodium chloride in the irrigation water. And that ranged from zero up to 80 millimolar. And then um, you could look at their growth in terms of relative uh, dry weight, for example. So that would be um, if the looking at the dry weight of a zero millimolar plant, um, and then what is the you know corresponding percent reduction in relative dry weight. And if you do that, then you can look at all of the plants together and see which ones are the most tolerant to to uh, this particular salt stress, and which ones are the most sensitive. Uh, if you don't do this type of equilibration, then you're looking at okay, or maybe petunias are a much larger plant to start with than a pansy, and so it's difficult to look at you know, the shape of the curve and how sensitive they are. So what we found is, yes, Peter. So every watering did, so it was a pretty excessive. adding more and more and more. That's right, uh-huh. Uh, we did take um, weekly uh, pour through leachate values to look at what was the pH and what was the electrical conductivity inside of the root zone. And what we found is that after a couple of weeks, we got a pretty stable uh, EC in the root zone. We did that because we applied a, a bit uh, excess irrigation water. So every time we watered, we leached a little bit of water. <laughs> and it also leached out a bit of soluble salts uh, as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so looking at just, just a few of the plants, so we found snapdragon and petunia were among the most tolerant that adding this 80 millimolar sodium chloride after five weeks, they were about half the size of control plants. Whereas there were some plants like uh, pansy, which were all dead at the end of the five week period. Um, so uh, snapdragons would be representative of the, the tolerant group and they, they produce uh, mannitol, uh, a carbohydrate that can act as an osmoprotectant. Um, pansies are very uh, sensitive. Salvia were, were quite sensitive, and, and begonia, you know, kind of intermediate in their <coughs> sensitivity and tolerance. So in the end, uh, we came up with this grouping where the most tolerant species, we said, had their dry weight reduced by 50 to 70 percent with 80 millimolar sodium chloride. Um, and these are somewhat artificial, but, you know, we looked at the 14 species and were there kind of some obvious groups that came out of it. Uh, somewhat tolerant plants, uh, moderately sensitive. And then the extremely sensitive plants were zinnia and pansy, which had 100% mortality at high salts. Um, I had the opportunity, now, now peas are not a floriculture crop. I guess sweet peas are a floriculture crop. Um, but I had a visiting scientist from Pakistan last year. And, and, um, and prior to that, I had met him virtually and had gotten to serve as a member of his graduate committee. Uh, he has been looking at the effect of salt stress on peas and initially did screening studies to look at which P genotypes were more tolerant and what were some of the underlying reasons for that. Uh, and then uh, he went on to look at some uh, exogenous applications of, of compounds to improve that tolerance. And I'll talk about that in a minute as well. So P is apparently a, an important crop in Pakistan. It's an important um, for the food of their culture. Uh, Pakistan as well as 11th in the world in pea production. Uh, producing 84,000 tons on 12,000 hectares. Um, and they also have problems with salts. Apparently 20% of their arable land is, is affected by salt. Uh, and so the work that he did um, is initially screening these 30p genotypes um, to sodium chloride in the irrigation water. 
Um, and that was added to achieve thresholds of uh, 0, 2.55 or 7.5 decisiemens uh, per meter. So that would be measured with an electrical conductivity meter. And eventually from those 30, he, he chose two that were quite, quite salt tolerant and representative of that group, and two that were quite sensitive and representative of that group. Um, and then he further went on to look at some of their, uh, the, the uh, morphology and physiology associated with their resistance and their tolerance. And just to highlight a uh, couple of his interesting findings, so we have um, two cultivars there, Ambassador and PF400, which were salt sensitive. And then we have two cultivars, Climax and Samarina Zard, which were tolerant. Uh, and looking at plant dry weight in response to increasing salinity. And I found that the most tolerant cultivars um, showed very little decrease, whereas there was this you know, quite linear, quite, quite uh, strong decrease in plant dry weight for the sensitive cultivars. Um, a very similar pattern was found as well for seed weight and for yield of the plant, so I'm not going to show those graphs. But essentially, you know, just by selecting from existing cultivars, you could, you could choose plants that are more uh, uh, able to be used on these saline soils. Um, this is interesting. This is, uh, the graphs can be difficult to read, but it's sodium content in the roots on the left side and the leaves on the right side. Uh, and what he found is that the two most tolerant cultivars actually accumulated a lot of sodium in their uh, roots. Um, but that did not get translocated to their leaves. So in the end, the, the, the sensitive cultivars accumulated a lot of sodium in their leaves. So it could be that, you know, sort of um, uh, trapped or held by the roots or just not, you know, uh, they had selectivity in their translocation and did not translocate that to their leaves. Uh, then a uh, suite of antioxidant enzymes was looked at and we talked about, you know, with the salt or increasing salt and drought stress you would uh, expect the plant to respond by um, enhancing its uh, antioxidant enzyme content and expression. Um, and what we found is that the sensitive cultivars really did not do that to a very large degree. So there would be the, the dark blue bar and the red bar, um, you know, really minor kind of increments in their antioxidant enzyme expression, whereas the more uh, tolerant cultivars, that seems to be a, a decently large mechanism involved in their tolerance. They were able to almost double the antioxidant enzymes. And this is superoxide dismutase, but that is uh, representative of several of the other of the enzymes that he looked at. Um, another mechanism for uh, salt tolerance uh, can be, we talked about um, osmoprotectants. And so glycine be betaine was one of the osmolites that was looked at. Um, and that was a quite similar story as the uh, antioxidant enzymes, where it really did not increase to much of a degree for the sensitive plants, but the tolerant plants exposed to high salts, um, you know, doubled the amount of uh, osmolites that they had. Uh, so the conclusion from that work was that salt stress significantly reduced these, these attributes that we looked at, growth and yield and so on. Um, but the, the salt tolerance potential of p-genotypes types is highly linked with a couple of these traits, and that was osmolites and antioxidant enzymes, um, as well as the restricted movement of sodium chloride from the roots to the leaves. And so if you were selecting, you know, if you were going back to screen, you know, 30 genotypes, 100 genotypes of peas and looking at which ones were tolerant to salt, these would, these would probably be good characteristics to look at as indicators for, uh, for salt toler tolerant genotypes. Uh, so with that, I wanted to uh, look at exogenous compounds that uh, can improve tolerance. And so you could think about, okay, is there something that I can spray on my plant or apply to my plant that can make it withstand this, uh, this stress better? Um, and so my colleague in Pakistan has looked at brisinosteroids, and I'll talk about them first. They're uh, from the steroid class of hormones, and they apparently improve membrane stability and osmotic adjustment and also have effects you know, on, on gene signaling and enhancing the plant defense system. Um, a second project I'll talk about was with uh, seaweed or a kelp extract, a commercial product called Stimplex. Um, and it does have uh, high concentration of betaenes which are acting as osmolites, but it really contains hundreds of compounds and we're just beginning to understand which of those hundreds of compounds are, are important in the stress tolerance benefits of seaweed. 
Um, and then last is silicon, which is considered a beneficial nutrient, but not an essential nutrient. Um, and it apparently mediates uh, systemic resistance by the plant, does have an effect on antioxidant enzyme expression and membrane stability. So we'll delve into those a little bit more. So a bit more with, with Adnan's work, um, and, and he, he's gotten 50 pages written on this in his PhD thesis, um, but to, to summarize this simply, uh, one experiment that he did with this brisinosteroid was uh, soak seeds with a brisinosteroid, or not soak them with a brisinosteroid, um, prior to salt stress, and he did that as a seed soaking treatment as well. Uh, and he used uh, one millimolar sodium chloride and 10 millimolar sodium chloride, uh, and whereas the type of brisinosteroid that he used was applied at uh, 10 micromolar. Uh, and if you look at the, the plant dry weight, now I don't have significance bars in here uh, to make things brief, but essentially, so if you, if you soaked the seeds in salt uh, that reduced their dry weight, if you uh, soaked them in the brisinosteroid first and then with, with salt, um, you could enhance the dry weight even above the control dry weight. And he's also got treatments where he just used the, the brisinosteroid and their, their dry weight was even greater than within these plants. Um, and he looked at several different parameters that were associated with that, and he found that the brisinosteroids did improve the, the activity or the production of antioxidant enzymes, uh, increased photosynthetic parameters, and so on. So this could be a, a you know, potentially useful tool in mitigating that salt stress. Uh, I had a chi couple Chinese scientists that looked with this commercial extract of a kelp, um, and looking at whether this alleviated salt stress in petunia verbena, tomato, and snapdragon. Um, and essentially what we did is we grew these seedlings, we transplanted them, um, and then kind of similar to Gonzalo's work, we gave them salt um, continuously in the irrigation water, and that was 40 millimolar um, salt. So what we have noted here is that we have, the treatments are without sodium chloride, uh, without sodium chloride, and then those are minus stimplex, or the kelp extract, or plus stimplex, which is that kelp extract. And then we have plus 40 millimolar sodium chloride, but without the kelp extract, uh, plus sodium chloride, um, and with that kelp extract. And in particular, um, we, see that we saw this trend for all four species, but with Pertunia and Verbena, it was significant for all of the treatments is that if we have control plants, so not exposed to salt, so that would be like the blue bar on the left, if we then expose them to weekly drenches of Stimplex, which was applied at five milliliters per liter of this commercial preparation, we got a significant increase in the dry weight of the plant, and this could relate to you know the cytokinins potentially in it or other compounds. Uh, then if we, if we take a plant that, ex that is exposed to 40 millimolar sodium chloride, so like this petunia in the green bar, uh, you see that its growth is much reduced uh, compared to plants that didn't get salt. Uh, and if we add this, uh, this stimplex, this kelp extract, we saw a significant increase in its dry weight. So not enough you know, to get it anywhere back close to the control dry weight. This was a pretty severe salt stress though. Uh, so that, that we saw with Pertunia and Verbena. Uh, one of the things that we looked at um, was a uh, response for some of the photosynthetic parameters. Um, and if you look at just net photosynthetic rate, what we found, and I apologize for the changes in color, but the, the setup is very similar, is that um, could plants that were not treated with salt but received this uh, kelp extract um, had a greatly increased photosynthetic rate. Uh, however, when we looked at plants that had been treated with salt and then we looked at their photosynthetic rate, we did not see any significant differences between them. And it could be at that point, you know, the cells were so impaired that there was not this particular improvement on photosynthesis. But quite interesting that even control plants, you know, not treated with salt but got this kelp extract had improved photosynthetic rate. Uh, we've also started some trials where we've um, grown these plants in a greenhouse with weekly drenches of kelp extract. Um, and then we bring them to kind of a simulated retail environment. So um, just indoors, um, water them once, and then we let them 
we let them wilt as they will. And we find that, so this is a tomato five days with no water. And our control plant, if you can see, looks you know, somewhat more wilted than our kelp extract treated plant. And we're, um, we're repeating that research right now um, with a new uh, visiting Chinese scientist. Um, and we're going to look at that in uh, petunia and tomato. Um, so some of you have heard me speak before in silicon. The use of silicon as a potentially beneficial nutrient has, uh, has been a topic of interest for some years now in my lab. Um, and silicon is naturally found in soils. Um, plants absorb silicon as silicic acid, which is SiOH4 uh, or o O4H4, um, so a single unit of silicon surrounded by four oxygens and four hydrogens. Um, and uh, the people that have looked at, okay, what elements are necessary for a plant to complete its life cycle, um, as far as they've been able to exclude silicon out of, say, hydroponic solutions and look at it, they've never been able to prove that silicon was absolutely needed for higher plants to complete their life cycle. Um, but we find that um, there's a lot of reports, rice was a good example, that uh, rice accumulates something like 5 to 10 percent of its dry weight um, is silicon, so that's even more than nitrogen, which is the, the you know, essential nutrient that it takes in the greatest quantity. Um, that if you farmed rice in the same field for several decades, the soil can become depleted of the silicon. Um, and then they started seeing plants that were more prone to getting diseases, and if they supplemented that soil back with silicon, either like a potassium silicate or calcium silicate, or just by returning, say, um, say rice hulls back to the soil, that they would see this beneficial response uh, to disease tolerance. And there's this growing body of research that, um, that the same is true with various abiotic stresses as well. So with floriculture crops, um, we're typically growing them in a potting mix that doesn't have soil. So we don't expect a lot of silicon to be there. It's peat and perlite and some added nutrients. What we found uh, when we looked at the soilless substrates that we've used, that they have about 0.08 millimolar silicon in them. Um, the tap water at Cornell has a little bit of silicon as an impurity in it, so 0.03 millimolar silicon. And fertilizers might have a little bit of impurity in it. So we wonder, OK, is that enough uh, silicon impurity that if we add more silicon, it's not going to have any effect on the plant? Or is the opposite true? Is it beneficial to add this, uh, this supplemental silicon? So what we did is we grew uh, 21 floriculture species. We gave them 10 weekly drenches of either 0 or 4 millimolar silicon from potassium silicate. And then we looked at uh, leaf tissue silicon. And this, this can be hard to look at. This is the 21 species that we looked at. And we found that their leaf silicon content varied from um, petunia on the left side when it was unamended with potassium silicate had a concentration of about 200 parts per million. Um, when we amended it with silicon, that, that did go up to 500 parts per million, uh, all the way up to plants like verbena, our geranthemum, and terenia, which had up to about 4,000 or 4,500 parts per million uh, silicon. And so here, the dark bars refer to plants that were unamended with silicon, and the open bars are plants that were amended with silicon. So you'll see examples, especially some of the silicon accumulating plants that are here on the right side. So uh, when we did amend them with silicon, we see fairly dramatic increases in the leaf tissue levels. And then there's a, a broad group of plants down here that accumulate fairly low levels of silicon. Um, and so like this tuberous begonia, if we add silicon to the potassium silicate to the soil, there was no further enhancement of, of leaf tissue silicon. Uh, so we looked at um, which plant showed a significant increase in their leaf silicon content once we added it. Um, and so the, interesting that petunia, which had such low levels of silicon, whether it was amended or not, but if we did amend it, it absorbed something like 130% more silicon than the, than the unamended soils. So this was quite interesting. We measured several um, morphological parameters, so simple things like just uh, flower diameter, height of the plant, stem diameter, um, dry weight, fresh weight, and so on, and essentially found some very s subtle um, differences. Nothing hugely dramatic with silicon. In some cases, there were statistically significant differences where, say, flower diameter was maybe 5% um, wider when we had silicon, something like that. Um, 
We also found that cultivars within a species can vary in their silicon accumulating ability. So we found like geraniums, for example, uh, one cultivar that, that accumulated more silicon when we added it and another that did not. Um, and then in the end, what we found is that in the absence of, of stresses, silicon did not really have a dramatic effect on plant growth. Um, and about that time, there was this growing body of research that um, indeed most of the benefits of silicon are when you have some um, external stress, whether that be biotic or abiotic. Uh, so a postdoc that I had a few years ago looked at the role of silicon in poinsettia uh, post-harvest performance. And poinsettia is the second largest um, potted crop in the US, which was recently overtaken by um, Phalaenopsis orchids, uh, or just orchids in general, uh, a couple years ago. Um, and one of the things that he did, which I'm not going to really show you, is that he grew plants in the greenhouse with different uh, amounts of irrigation water. So 100% of their needs, 80% of their needs, or 60% of their needs. And um, so of course, if you grow a plant with less water um, than it's taking up, you end up with a smaller uh, plant. Um, and one of the things that he found is that adding silicon in as weekly drenches uh, into these treatments is that this reduction in, say, leaf surface area, or brack surface area, when the plant was only given 60% of its uh, water needs is that we saw some recovery in the BRAC surface area and some recovery of the leaf surface area when we added silicon. The other thing that we did is we took these plants into, a, again, a simulated retail environment, so the post-harvest environment, um, watered them once and then didn't water them again and, and looked at how long it took them to wilt. Uh, and we saw that the, especially for plants that received 100% of their irrigation needs, that if we added silicon, it took them longer to wilt. Um, and that's reflected here. We measured leaf angle, so a, a, a larger leaf angle means a um, you know, more wilted leaf, a leaf closer to 90 degrees would be a completely wilted leaf. And so interesting that of the, of, of the treatment, so plus and minus silicon in 60, 80, or 100% of their irrigation needs, the plants that um, had the lowest leaf angle were the silicon uh, treated plants and the ones that had wilted the most was especially the silicon treated plant that had gotten 100% or not silicon with 100% of its water needs. Um, we let the plants wilt and then we rewatered them and we found there was some uh, qualitative benefit at least uh, to having silicon for wilt to recovery. Um, my current postdoc, Mikkel Moyel, has looked more at silicon effects in Petunia. Um, and a lot of the work I'm going to talk about for the rest of the time it relates to Petunia. And we like Petunia because it's the largest um, bedding plant for wholesale value in the US. It's also been a genetic model for floriculture species for some 30 years now. A part of that has become because it's relatively easy to transform so you can get transgenic plants and look at the effects of genes. It's decently easy uh, to handle in tissue culture. And so we found uh, some work that Gonzalo did in hydroponics, just like work that he did in soil, found reductions in petunia growth with increasing um, sodium chloride salinity. Uh, so we wanted to know if, if silicon would improve petunia salt tolerance. And so Mikkel did uh, treatments with silicon at zero, two, or four millimolar, supplied as weekly drenches, uh, evaluated the plants after seven weeks, and they received a salt stress all along of zero up to 80 millimolar sodium chloride. Um, what she found is that the primary effects on the plants were the salinity effects. So this, this uh, table doesn't include silicon, but you know something like the shoot dry weight decreasing from 37 to 13 grams as sodium chloride increased, and very little kind of silicon interaction with that. Uh, when she looked a little deeper though, we could see kind of some very subtle indications that silicon was having benefits to the plant. Um, and so if we looked at leaf area, we have plants that uh, receive zero, two, or four millimolar uh, silicon and then the blue bars would be zero millimolar sodium chloride up to purple, which would be 80 millimolar sodium chloride. And so we found, um, in terms of statistical significance, um, if we didn't have silicon, but we have that 80 millimolar sodium chloride, um, we saw a reduction in leaf surface area. Um, if we had silicon, either at two or four millimolar, uh, 
that statistical significance goes away. So there was a pattern of reduction, but it wasn't large enough to be statistically significant in our ex experiment. Um, we measured chlorophyll index, and the lower leaves were interesting. Um, with the lower leaves, we saw a reduction in uh, chlorophyll uh, index uh, when we didn't have silicon at 80 millimolar sodium chloride. But if you look at the 2 and 4 millimolar sodium chloride treatments, we did not see a significant uh, reduction at all. So apparently helped to preserve the, um, the integrity of chlorophyll, potentially membrane integrity in the plant. And Mikkel wanted to know if, if this uh, would carry on through to some of the photosynthetic parameters. Um, and so she looked at, these are plants treated with 80 millimolar sodium chloride, and then they have silicon supplemented at 0, 2, and 4 millimolar. Um, and what she found is a pattern of, of increased um, net photosynthesis where we had silicon. Um, however, not statistically significant. With transpiration, or the rate of, of water loss out of the leaves, we saw a significant, uh, we saw a reduction, but not significant. But when she multiplied the two to get predicted water use efficiency, that is the, um, you know, the net um, CO2 that's fixed per uh, unit of water that's used. Uh, when you combine the two, we do get this statistically significant trend that we have improved water use efficiency. And so that's very much in line with the uh, previous work that we had with like the drought tolerance in the poinsettia. Uh, Mikkel has also exposed petunia to heat stress. Um, and heat stress we see in the greenhouse, we definitely see in the landscape, especially in the southern half of the U.S. Uh, she initially exposed uh, petunia to 35 degrees Celsius or 40 degrees Celsius continuously for either uh, 24 hours, 72 hours, and then after 72 hours, pulling it out and looked at uh, recovery. And what we see is uh, we, we have wilt index here on the uh, y-axis, and then we have heat exposure and then the recovery period. And we find that plants that the silicon treated plants um, after one day and then significant after 72 hours um, and significant in the recovery period had significantly less wilt uh, than their control counterparts. Um, and with 35 degrees Celsius, we saw that trend at 72 degrees um, but, or 72 hours, but in the end was not a significant trend by the time we got to recovery. Um, and the picture here, the left would be the silicon treated plants at 40 degrees Celsius for three days, and the right would be the plants that did not get silicon. Uh, she followed that up a little bit more. So with, uh, with 40 degrees Celsius plants, she measured their leaf temperature um, prior to their stress, and then 24 and 72 hours into the stress. And she found a significant reduction in leaf temperature. So maybe that relates to, um, she, wa she watered the plants well throughout the the period, but maybe they have some improved cooling capacity with the silicon. Um, and chlorophyll fluorescence, or FV over FM, a measure of uh, efficiency of the photosynthetic apparatus. Uh, we have plants on the left, um, those three different colored bars were control two and four millimolar silicon um, before they got 40 degrees Celsius stress, and then after two days of that stress, what we found is that the plants that didn't have silicon, the controls, um, their, their efficiency was quite reduced, where uh, reductions were not uh, so severe when they had two or four millimolar silicon during the plant production phase. Okay, so we can use you know existing compounds, um, whether they're beneficial nutrients or kelp extract or so on, and improve uh, stress tolerance. I wanted to touch on a moment. Um, uh, molecular techniques to improve uh, tolerance. And uh, s the work that Mikkel's currently doing is in rice, they know the two um, carrier genes in the roots that are responsible for active silicon uptake. Um, and so far, those genes have mostly been found in graminaceous species. Uh, there's one case of a dicot where they found a silicon uptake carrier, and that's in. Um, uh, cucurbit, which is about 1% by dry weight. By comparison, um, you know, rice was 5 or 10% silicon by dry weight. Petunia is about um, 0 0.02, 0 0.05% by dry weight. And so what Mikkel has done is cloned these rice silicon transporters, um, and we've generated transgenic petunia lines with the transporter 1 or LSI1, 
and the transporter 2, LSI 2. Um, and, in, and I'll talk in a minute about uh, work that she's doing screening. Um, L, you know, if, you, if a plant just has overexpressed LSI 1 or just has overexpressed LSI 2, if there's a particular stress benefit. The other thing that she's doing is now working on crosses of these plants to obtain uh, a homozygous line that has uh, single transgene copies of both of them. So we can look at, okay, if you have the combination of the two carriers together, does that give you a further enhancement? Um, and okay, so essentially Mikkel did qPCR and found that she had about a dozen lines each for LSI1 and LSI2 of plants that were enhanced in their relative expression. Um, and the bars are kind of misleading. So even like with LSI1 in this top graph here, we have plants that have you know, seven times the expression of actin all the way up to plants that have, I don't know, 9,000, 20,000 times the, um, the expression as a housekeeping gene. Um, and a similar story for LSI2. So anyways, she was successful in, in obtaining a range of transgenic lines that varied in their expression levels. Uh, for those LSI1 overexpressed plants, um, we grew them in a greenhouse with supplemental either uh, 0 0.5 or 2 millimolar silicon. Um, and an interesting thing is some of the highly expressing lines at uh, 2 millimolar silicon, we could see a bit of phytotoxicity. If you see that leaf in the lower right. Um, and yet, if we look at the, um, the, the silicon content in the tissue, we don't see a particular, especially at 2 millimolar silicon, we don't see a significant difference in the silicon content of those leaves as compared to a wild type plant. So something may be related to the, we use 35S as the promoter for the gene, not a root specific promoter. Um, <coughs> looking at the silicon uh, content, we did see that um, if for our transgenic plants, um, with no silicon amended at all, they statistically had the same silicon content levels as, um, as a wild type plant with 0.5 millimolar silicon. And then uh, transgenic plants with 0.5 millimolar silicon um, statistically had the same amount of silicon in them as a wild type plant uh, with two millimolar silicon. So, you know, one potential benefit of these plants is they could be um, better posed to scavenge the, the silicon that is existing in the soil and not having to apply exogenous silicon to obtain the same benefit. Um, and she did, she did screen five of the lines to uh, heat stress. Um, and she found that there was uh, significant um, reduction in wilt index for some of the lines. Um, and she's just started now to look at some of the, the explanations for that. And she has shown, uh, for example, a lower leaf temperature, um, again, for the transgenic lines, even at 0.5 millimolar silicon. Whereas for wild type plants, um, it took at least two millimolar silicon to see those benefits. Uh, I just wanted to point out, Mikkel is collaborating with Dr. Andre Kessler in the Ecology and Evolutionary Biology Department. Um, and Mikkel has a background in, in analyzing volatiles in plants and manipulating that process. And they're looking at cucumber. Um, they're, they're feeding it three different types or, of herbivores, or they're giving it three different types of herbivores and with or without silicon, and then looking at, um, at uh, you know, herbivory or damage to the leaf as well as some of the fingerprint of the volatile compounds that are given off. Um, and that's very much in its preliminary stages. And I wanted to mention my grad student, Gonzalo, is working on my PhD with me. And one of the projects that he's looking at, uh, it's one of the chapters in his PhD, is exploiting the triolose pathway to improve salt and drought tolerance of petunia. So um, this, this is a pathway that's previously uh, been used, but um, in the past, so we have, we have um, some intermediates to trihalose, which is a, a sugar, um, and two of the potential bottlenecks, uh, the enzymes that mediate those would be TPS and TPP. Um, in the past, uh, people have looked at overexpressing uh, TPS in plants, and they found an improved salt tolerance and drought tolerance. And um, what we want to do is look at, okay, is the combination of both required, or can we get a more efficient response if they're both required, or if we add them uh, both together? Um, and using petunia as our model species, you know, the petunia genome hasn't been sequenced yet, 
um, but using tomato as a reference genome, Gonzalo was able to clone TPS and TPP um, successfully from Petunia and sequence them um, and confirm their function in a yeast uh, system. So that adds a bit to the, our knowledge on Petunia genes, and he, so he's added those into the NCBI uh, database. So ultimately, we're looking at does the expression of TPS and TPP improve salt and drought tolerance? Um, do the, either of the genes alone work or combined? Uh, are they more efficient? Uh, as well as there's this growing body of evidence that um, the total amount of tree halose that is accumulated isn't so important that it's acting more as a signaling molecule as opposed to in primitive plants, um, a large amount of triolose can accumulate, and there it's acting as an osmoprotectant. So we'd like to sort out, OK, are, are benefits related to more signaling or to um, that osmoprotection? All right, so with that, I would just conclude by saying, you know, tackling these world problems of resource shortages is going to take you know, all of our combined efforts to do that, and essentially this integrated approach of um, there's room for people to look at production practices that use these resources efficiently. Uh, we've talked about screening and other people of, of doing breeding of plants that tolerate stress, um, exogenous compounds that we can use to enhance stress tolerance, and then ultimately, you know, the, uh, these molecular approaches were, are rewarding as well. So I'll thank you for your attention, and I'll ask if there's any questions. <laughs> Yeah, that's interesting. And um, I had thought one of my hypotheses was, OK, maybe uh, for the silicon benefit uh, with, um, with uh, heat stress or drought stress or salt stress, something like that, maybe it allows the, the um, plant to use uh, water more efficiently. And that, that does seem to be the case. But yet there's some underlying reason. So you know, there's less transpiration from the leaf surface. You'd think there'd be less of a loss of that heat energy. So it seems like there's some other mechanism that's taking place. Um, and I don't have a great hypothesis for that. I know that there was actually a, sort of a biophysicist looking at the problem. And they found if there were uh, decent um, cuticular deposits of silicon, that they acted as kind of this heat sink of the leaf. Um, and so in that case, it was very much a physical kind of benefit of these cuticular deposits in the leaf. Um, but that, that, uh, I haven't looked at that at all for any of the, the species that I've looked at with silicon. So that's interesting. The question is, could some of the silicon benefits be reflectance? But you have less energy being absorbed by the leaf. That would account for that. Have you ever thought of re measuring and reflecting? Yeah. I think I, w I, I would certainly follow through with that. And I'm not familiar with literature looking at that. Um, for plants that, for graminaceous plants that accumulate a lot of silicon, one of the benefits that they're talking about is a physical benefit of having a more upright plant that can sometimes intercept more light for photosynthesis. But that would be, you know, that's a different kind of phenomenon, but the, just that reflectance itself would be interesting to pursue. Mm -hmm. The question is, do the plants look different? Uh, for them, from what I can tell from, from wild type plants that I've treated with silicon, it's very hard, I cannot really discern differences. Um, with poinsettias, I could find slightly thicker stems when they were treated with silicon. It was interesting for me for um, Mikkel, one of the transgenic lines that she had that was, that was highly expressing LSI1, we did see a more erect kind of petunia. So it was the, the wild type is more of the sprawling kind of petunia form. And one of the transgenic lines was decently more erect, which I would say had a firmer stem and a wider stem. So in that case, there was, at least in this transgenic case, a, a morphological difference. And I would say in probably rice starved of silicon compared to rice given plenty of silicon, you would see those type of differences. And, and I would say the, the reason we jumped to tree halos was we knew it had worked in the past in Arabidopsis. I was interested in saying, OK, I'm a floriculturist, but demonstrating that we can use molecular biology techniques in a floriculture crop. Um, but then there are some interesting questions related to the tree halose pathway that aren't answered even in Arabidopsis. So that's something that we could potentially contribute to the literature. Um, one of Gonzalez's chapters is going to be um, uh, Illumina 
uh, high throughput sequencing of petunias um, with and without salt stress for varying lengths of time. And so that would be very much like what you're talking about where uh, looking at the existing body um, and seeing which, ge which genes are highly involved in, say, salt tolerance, if that's our... So, so yeah, we'll get there, Peter. Yeah, and so in that sense, realizing that the toolkit that we have with Arabidopsis, with, with uh, knockouts that exist, and the, you know, a, our genome that has been fully sequenced and so on will help us move forward to answer those questions um, more directly, right? Oh, that's a great question. Gonzalo and I talk about that a, a lot, whether transgenic Floriculture crops might be more accepted by the public than transgenic food crops. Um, and I don't know the answer to that. I was talking with, I was at a conference in the Netherlands a couple weeks ago, and some colleagues there were saying that the public there is quite resistant to GMOs in what other, whatever, whether they eat it or not. Um, yet in Japan, we have the first case of a transgenic flower, a, a so-called blue rose, that, um, that is now uh, licensed there on the market, and that is apparently available in the US now, although I've never seen them. Um, ultimately, you know, if you want to get a transgenic crop, you're gonna have to spend something, what was it, several hundred million dollars, Peter would have answers to that, you know, to go through the, the hoops of showing this is a safe, uh, plant to use in, in its given case and that the uh, and so on and so the those obstacles if you look at floriculture crops compared to like corn you know petunia which is the the largest value bedding plant is worth 200 million dollars a year so no one's going to spend a hundred million dollars in hoops in trying to get a transgenic uh, petunia yeah at least we don't have to do feeding trials but you know we'd still have to do like pollinator trials and then okay, are there petunias in the landscape that the gene could spread to, and do you need male sterility, and things like that. So uh, ultimately, it's a ways off. I think if we ever get to a more streamlined um, procedure where they said, okay, if you're a floriculture crop, not a food crop, um, you only have to pass through these hurdles um, and made that more efficient, I think, I think we could get there. Mm -hmm. All right, Neil, thank you very much. Thanks. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.